Let's turn now to this passage as we look at King Ahab, one of the more famous kings of Israel. And I'm titling this message, uh, The King Who Was Too Nice. Uh, The King Who Was Too Nice. And nice might seem a strange word uh, to use of King Ahab. Um, When we remember King Ahab, we remember him as one of the most wicked kings of Israel, and with good reason. Uh, If you were to look earlier in the book of 1 Kings, uh, when it describes King Ahab in uh, chapter chapter 16, verse 31, uh, it says that Ahab became king in verse 30. Then in verse 31 it says, And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of uh, Ethbal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Not a very glowing uh, description of King Ahab. And yet I'm calling him this morning the king who was too nice. And although the Bible does indeed uh, say he was one of the most wicked kings that Israel ever had, the reality is that if you met him, you would probably have found him quite agreeable. Uh, You may even have liked him. He was not as outwardly cruel as many of the other kings of Israel or even Judah. Uh, If you read, actually, and I encourage you to do this perhaps this afternoon, uh, read the story of King Ahab, and when you look at actually what he did to other people, he was surprisingly mild. Ahab's problem wasn't primarily cruelty. He didn't seem to have a particular lust for power and for control as such. Ahab's chief problem was weakness. That was Ahab's chief problem. If you like, he was a people pleaser. Uh, He molded himself to the opinions of those around him. And chiefly, as we've just mentioned, this was his wife, Jezebel. Uh, There was not too much he could do for his wife, Jezebel. And she led him away from God, and he meekly followed. Ahab was a weak king who followed the opinions of those around him. And this is a problem (laughs) that afflicts many people today. Uh, I'm sure uh, you can see examples of this with people you know, perhaps even in your own life. Uh, There's a strong desire in our society to please those around us, to be thought of as nice. Um, What being nice is, when you really boil it down, is, is being approved of by those around us. And many people have this burning desire to be liked and to be thought of as nice. And I read an article from a young man just a few weeks ago, and he said how he would often be embarrassed by his parents when he would go to a restaurant with them. Because if something wasn't uh, quite how they expected it to be, they would call over the waiter or waitress and ask to see the manager. And the son would cringe in his seat as they would berate the manager to their face. And he was like, oh, just let it go. Because he didn't like the the confrontation and the the awkwardness of the situation. Then he realized that although he disliked that confrontation and and the potential bad opinion that waiter or waitress will have of them, he realized that when he got home, he would more than happily write an email or complaint or go on TripAdvisor and give a bad review. When he was anonymous, when he wasn't faced face-to-face with the confrontation, he could make the complaint. But he didn't want to appear unpleasant in the eyes of others. On the internet, it's different. 
And that really sums up our society. We want to appear outwardly nice to other people, but then we're vile when we're anonymous. People don't really want to be kind. People don't really want to be loving. They just want to be seen as it. That's a problem that afflicts our society, and it's not new. Uh, It happened back in the days when this passage was written as well. And we'll see from this chapter in particular how Ahab wanted to appear well in the eyes of others how he had this burning desire to seem nice. But we'll see the extreme danger of that desire from this chapter. So let's go into this chapter now in more detail. And we'll see three points, uh, just three points to teach us, uh, and hopefully that we'll be able to apply to our lives uh, today. And the first thing I just want to point out is the weakness of Ahab. The weakness of Ahab in this chapter. Uh, You'll notice at the beginning of the chapter, uh, the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, comes and knocks on the gate, as it were, of Samaria, which was Ahab's capital city. And he says to him, essentially, your silver and your gold are mine, your best wives and your children are also mine. And I wonder how how you would respond if someone knocked on your door and declared that your bank account is theirs. Uh, that your spouse is theirs and your children too. Uh, Imagine you might be a little bit peeved. Imagine you'd have a few words to say to that person. But look how Ahab responds. In verse 4, Ahab essentially says, As you say, my lord, O king, I am yours and all that I have. (laughs) What a pathetic response to give to this king. He's like a little puppy before a Rottweiler, and he rolls over and submits to Ben-Hadad. It's likely that Ahab thought that these were just words from Ben-Hadad, that uh, Ben-Hadad would sort of strut around and show the Israelites who was boss, and then he would go away. And Ahab is just trying to appease him until he goes away and leaves them alone. But unfortunately, Ben-Hadad's words are not just words. Ahab submits, but then Ben-Hadad sends another message. And he says, okay, I'll come and collect them tomorrow. If your wife and your children and your uh, silver and your gold are mine, I'll come and receive them tomorrow and make sure they are ready for me. And you can see that Ahab now has a problem. Uh, He was willing to submit verbally, but now he really has to pay up to this bully, Ben-Hadad. And And he essentially goes wailing to his elders. And you can see what he says in verse 7. He says in verse 7 to the elders of Israel and all the people, he says, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeks mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives and for my children and for my silver and for my gold, and I denied him not. He goes to his elders and he's basically saying, what shall I do? I haven't objected to any of his demands. I've done everything he wanted, yet he still wants to take my money and all my possessions. And the elders respond and they manage to persuade him, don't capitulate. Don't give in to King Ben Hadad. It's almost like Ahab was considering it in his mind, and he had to take these elders and all the people in verse 8 to say, No, don't listen to him, don't give everything to King Ben Hadad. And as a result, you hear Ben Hadad's response in verse 10. He says, The gods do so unto me, and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. What that means is, is Ben-Hadad is saying, my army is so huge and we are going to destroy Samaria so completely that every member of my army won't have enough to have a handful of the dust of Samaria. That's how much we are going to destroy your city. That's the situation at the beginning of this passage and it perfectly illustrates to us the weakness of King Ahab. This leads on to the second lesson 
from this passage. And that is the grace of God. The grace of God. Ben-Hadad sends this message to King Ahab and to the city of Samaria, saying he's going to wipe it out completely. So there's barely going to be enough dust left for his soldiers to carry. And Ahab manages to respond with a retort. Uh, He manages to summon up a little bit of courage. Do you see what he said in verse 11? And it says, And the king of Israel answered and said unto him, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. That's basically the Israelite equivalent of don't count your chickens before they're hatched. He says, don't boast as you're putting your armor on before the battle. Boast when you're taking it off after the battle, when you've won the victory. Ahab's saying this may not go the way you think it will. So we see that Ahab has a little glimmer of courage, a little glimmer of of faith. And almost immediately, out of nowhere, a prophet of God comes to speak to Ahab. Uh, you can see that in verse 13. It says, and behold. And I understand that word behold uh, implies that kind of idea that this prophet came suddenly out of nowhere. Uh, it says, verse 13, and behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus says the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold. I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know I am the Lord. Now remember, Ahab is a wicked king. And there's no doubt about that. He's meekly followed his wife's example. Uh, he's built altars to foreign gods. He's built idols of foreign gods. He's rejected God. He's thrown God behind his back, as Jeroboam had done many generations before. And yet, God blesses his small act of courage. This is a bit like what Christ said when he said, if we have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. Ahab takes one small step to do what he should do as king of Israel to defend the people that God has given to him, uh, to look after his city. He takes one small step in that direction, and God reaches out to him with grace. If you bend your will to Christ's will, uh, if you surrender to God in even just the smallest way, God, it's no exaggeration to say, will bend heaven and earth for you. Uh, We read earlier, although we didn't dwell on it very much, uh, when we looked at King Asa, a verse which God said to Asa. And he said, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to lend strong support to those whose heart is perfect towards him. In other words, God is looking for people to show his strength to. All he wants to see is someone who is looking up to him. Someone who is willing to rely on him. Someone who is willing to leave their own self-sufficiency and trust in him. And God is scanning over the earth looking for an upraised face to him. Now this is a pretty feeble upraised face. But God takes it, and he takes this small act of faith on Ahab's part. It's a wonderful encouragement uh, to each and every one of us. Uh, You might be here this morning, and you might be thinking, you've gone too far. Uh, Your sin is too great for God to listen to you. Uh, Your situation is too complicated. You've messed up too much And you've gone too far away from God. Well, let Ahab encourage you here. Ahab had gone a long way from God. His sin was very great. But God blessed even the smallest act of faith. When Jesus was asked 
when he was on earth. When he was asked by the people, what shall we do that we may do the works of God? In other words, they, they said to Jesus, and they said, what do we do that we might please God? What, what is it that God wants us to do? Christ responded, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. That's what God requires of us. He doesn't require us to go on a long pilgrimage to some holy city. Uh, He doesn't require of us to do some great feat for him. All he requires is us to rely on him. To turn from going our own way and to trust him. To stop thinking we've got it sorted. To stop rejecting God and instead say, no God, you know. You know what is best. Teach me. Show me your way. And when we do that, the Bible says we receive as a gift eternal life. We receive forgiveness of sins. That's the power of faith. Because it doesn't rest in our own power. It doesn't rest in our own ability. It doesn't rest in our own goodness. It rests in what God can do. What he has done for us. So you see here, Ahab's small act of faith results in God pouring out his grace upon him. And God can do the same for you. Uh, No matter how messy your life has become, uh, no matter how much sin you have committed, if only you will repent of it, if only you will turn back to him, he is willing to fight on your behalf. I remember once many years ago, uh, when I was um, first working, and um, I was working in a, uh, as a customer service res- representative in a, in a place which sold log cabins. And um, to cut a long story short, I, I made a little bit of a mistake. I was um, told to do something, and I felt that it was wrong to do. Uh, I considered it to be a lie. Um, in hindsight now, I think I was a little bit overly scrupulous. About the time I felt the right thing to do was to stand up and not do this thing. And to uh, cut a long story short, I ended up losing that job. I'd messed up. Um, As I say, in hindsight, um, I was probably a bit too overzealous. And this put me into a very difficult situation. uh, Because job agencies wouldn't have me. Uh, because uh, they would ask for references from your previous work, and they would ask, uh, why did you leave your previous work? And it didn't look very good for me. Now, that was a small act of faithfulness on my part. It was a mistaken act of faithfulness. And yet God was merciful even in that. God blesses the smallest acts of faith, even when they are mistaken. It reminds me a bit of Gideon in the Old Testament in the book of Judges. And um, he was told by God to destroy the idol in his father's garden. And uh, Gideon's afraid. (laughs) And so he goes by night. You think, what a feeble thing to do, you know. Uh, He's told to do this thing by God, but he's afraid of the people. So he goes in the midst of night so that nobody can see him when he destroys the idol. Nevertheless, God blesses him. Despite his cowardice, He shows a small act of faith. He obeys God despite his fear. And God blesses that act of obedience. So take courage from that yourself. God blesses the smallest acts of faith towards him. The smallest acts of obedience. And he wins the victory. We won't go into all the details because it would take too long. Uh, But Ahab obeys God and his people go out and they win the victory. But then he's warned. He's warned by a prophet again from God saying, the army will come back. The army of Syria will return in the spring. Be ready to receive them then. And this is again another important lesson for us. Uh, Faith is not just one act in our life. Um, You can't say, oh, I became a Christian, I did this thing 20 years ago, and I became a Christian, and that was it. Uh, The Christian life is a walk of faith. Step by step, day by day, looking to Christ. It's no good saying, I looked to Christ 20 years ago. Uh, 
Do you look to him today? Do you rely on him today? Do you trust him today? That is the life that Christ calls us to. So this is what we see in the second lesson. The grace of God towards Ahab after a very small, feeble act of faith. But then we come to the third and last lesson. The third and last lesson is the danger of niceness and its remedy. The danger of niceness and its remedy. And again, we can't go into all the details. Uh, We do not have uh, nowhere near as much time as we need. Uh, But to cut a long story short, Ben-Hadad loses... Uh, The first battle, uh, he goes again in the spring and he loses the second battle and he has to flee away on his horse and he hides in an inner chamber. And he sends his servants, or his servants advise him to go and beg mercy from King Ahab because they say to him, the kings of Israel are merciful kings. Maybe if you beg for mercy, they will grant you it. And so Ben-Hadad does. He sends messengers uh, to Um, King Ahab, it says in verse uh, 32 of chapter 20. It says, So they girded sackcloth on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Ben-Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. Uh, They come meekly with sackcloth and with ropes around their neck and they they kneel before King Ahab and they say, Ben-Hadad begs for mercy. Please let him live. Did you notice Ahab's response in verse 33? In verse 32, sorry. He said, is he yet alive? He is my brother. (laughs) Ahab hears this message and he welcomes Ben-Hadad, the king who twice now has tried to destroy his city, who a few verses earlier was bullying him to give him his wives and his children and his silver and his gold, And now he's calling him his brother. He essentially embraces him and gives him a hug and says, yes, all is forgiven. I am your brother. You are like family to me. Now you might think, oh, well, that's that's a godly thing to do. Um, Jesus said that we should love our enemies after all. Uh, Ahab is showing wonderful mercy and grace to the king of Syria. And if you were to read onwards into 2 Kings chapter 5, you find a not dissimilar situation where King Ahab's son Joram uh, defeats, well, he doesn't really defeat, but um, God delivers the Syrian army into Ahab's son's hands. And Ahab's son asks Elisha, the prophet of God, what should I do? Should I kill them? And Elisha says no. Don't kill the Syrian army, but feed them. Give them water and give them food and let them return. And so you might think, well, this is good from Ahab. He's showing wonderful grace and mercy. But there's a big difference, two big differences, between this situation and the situation that would later happen with Ahab's son. We need to remember that God is a God of mercy, but he's also a God of justice. Uh, What if, for example, by showing mercy to one person, it results in the death of hundreds of thousands more? Is that really good? Is that really merciful? It might be merciful to the one, but is it to the hundreds of others who die? Do you see how righteousness, godliness, isn't so simple? It's not simply about showing grace and mercy to everyone who asks for it. God doesn't do that. God doesn't simply forgive everyone. There are conditions. And so it should be for us. And Ahab, he shows mercy to this king of Syria. Now, this man, Ben-Hadad, had shown that he was not a trustworthy king. He was the ruler of the army. He had great control and authority and therefore great responsibility as well. Later on, his son Joram released the army. He didn't release the king. Ahab was not at liberty to play fast and loose with this evil king, Ben-Hadad. Secondly, Ahab's son 
asked Elisha, who was the prophet of God, what he should do. Ahab does not inquire of God at all in this passage, uh, at least not in this part. He doesn't ask God what he should do. He doesn't ask God if he should release Ben-Hadad or not. Instead, he just simply relies upon his own feelings and his own desires, most likely motivated by a desire to be friends with the great king Ben-Hadad. And in doing so, he makes a huge mistake. And it says that Ahab, uh, he leaves after making a treaty, making a covenant with ben king of Syria. And he goes off with a sort of glow of happiness, uh, for, for probably the, full of a good feeling of a, a good deed done. Uh, perhaps he's thinking of writing a book about how little acts of kindness uh, can do so much. And he's uh, in this kind of glow of happiness at his own kindness and niceness and mercy. When he meets a man by the road and this man has a bandage over his face and this man uh, comes to Ahab and he says that he's got a problem and his problem was that in the battle a soldier had come to him and had compelled him to look after a prisoner of war and the soldier had said to him that if he didn't take care of this prisoner of war, if he let him escape, then his life would be forfeit. And if he refused to look after this prisoner of war, then he would have to pay a talent of silver. You might say in that situation, just pay the talent of silver. Um, Easier just to pay the money than to look after this prisoner of war. That's until you realise that a talent of silver, at least today, would be worth about £20,000. Most people don't just have that lying about to give. And so this man is compelled to take care of this prisoner of war, but he says he was busy here and there, and this prisoner of war escapes. He gets away. And he asks the king, what should I do? (laughs) What should I do in my situation? And Ahab's quite dismissive. Ahab says, well, you got yourself into the situation You need to get yourself out of it. Uh, You accepted the prisoner of war. Deal with it. But then the man takes off the bandage. And Ahab recognizes him as one of the prophets. And his heart sinks. He knows that what he's going to hear next isn't going to be good. And the prophet tells him that Ahab is like the man who was charged with a prisoner of war. God had delivered Ben-Hadad into his hands. And yet Ahab had let him go. He was busy here and there, and he had let Ben-Hadad escape. God exposes here the folly of merely being nice. By being nice, Ahab has put the whole nation in jeopardy. Ahab has refused to take on the responsibility that God gave to him. And this is the irony, and this is the lesson. Often, if our motivation is simply to please others, as Ahab's was, then it often ends up causing more harm than good. It ends up being worse for others and even for ourselves than it would have been if we had just stood firm. This is even illustrated in the passage. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, just before the account of Ahab with this prophet of God, um, we learn how the prophet got to be in the situation he was. And we're told that the prophet had been told by God to ask a friend to punch him in the face so that he would be wounded so that he could put the bandage on to later deceive Ahab. But his friend wouldn't do it. His friend said, no, I don't want to punch you. That'd be nasty. That'd be mean. And he doesn't do what God says, even though it's the command of God himself. And as a result, he's killed by a lion. Now, when you read that, first of all, you think, that's a bit harsh. He refused to punch his friend, and now he gets killed by a lion. But the lesson is this. The lesson is that if you don't listen to God, 
then the consequences are far worse than they would be otherwise. It's more important to listen to what God says than to merely please others, to merely be nice. Sometimes we have to say things and do things which don't appear nice, but actually are in the long run. That's the third lesson from this passage. Beware seeking to please others. Beware being satisfied with being seeming nice in the eyes of others. And as I said at the beginning, uh, this is such a problem in our society. And if we're honest, it's a problem in our own lives as well. Uh, how many friends are there in the world who are so desperate to be liked They become the slave of others. Uh, They even get abused and mistreated, but they are so uh, in love with being liked that they accept it. Uh, We have boyfriends and girlfriends who are desperate to please their partner at any cost, even at the cost of their own well-being. Uh, We have parents who are desperate to be liked by their children. Uh, And so they're kind, they're generous, they're forgiving of their children, but they never administer discipline. They never show the child the right way to live because they just want to be liked by them. Then they wonder why their children grow up to be monsters. We have husbands who are desperate not to offend their wives. And they're so desperate to please their wives that they're willing to displease God. That was the first sin, wasn't it? Do you remember the Garden of Eden? Uh, Adam in the garden. Eve batted her eyelashes and handed the fruit to uh, to Adam. And Adam ignores what God told him. He rejects what God said and he listened to his wife. Just to be clear, the lesson there isn't that you shouldn't listen to your wife if you are a husband. The lesson is you shouldn't listen to your wife if she tells you not to listen to God. That's the lesson. We listen to God first and others second. And do you know what happens when we do that? When we put God first, everything else falls into place. You actually start loving those around you Better. When your love is first and foremost fixed on God, then you start to treat people in the way they were meant to be treated. You don't make you don't make yourself their slave, instead you become their helper to make them more like God. You will say to them no when they want to do something that is harmful. And in so doing, you will benefit them more than if you simply caved into what they wanted. God does not command that we be liked. That's not a requirement for God. God requires that we're righteous. God requires that we do good. We aren't nasty for the sake of being nasty, but we do what is right, what is true, what is good, because that is best for us, and it's also best for everyone around us. Yet so many have an itch and a desire to be well thought of by others, that they do it at the cost of being well thought of by God. But lastly, uh, now this might be, that last point may be a discouragement to us. Uh, You may look in your life and you may see times where you have fallen for this very problem. Uh, You have made yourself the slave of someone else. You have been more uh, afraid of offending someone else than you have been of offending God. So I just want to close by reminding you, remember the grace of God. Remember the second lesson from this passage. Ahab had messed up greatly. He had listened to his wife Jezebel every single whim at the expense of listening to God. And yet when he turned back to God, when he repented in the smallest possible sense, God was there waiting for him. You may have messed up your life. You may have made terrible mistakes in your life. But it's not too late 
for you. God is there ready and waiting for the smallest smidgen of courage in following him. And he's able to pour out all his grace upon you. Turn back to him, listen to him, and you'll discover what a gracious God he is. That's why I've chosen as our final hymn, uh, number 712. 712, which is an exhortation, an encouragement to us to fight the good fight of faith, not to rely on our own thinking, not to rely on our own wisdom, but to rely on God, more specifically to rely on on Christ and what, on what he tells us. Number 712, fight the good fight with all thy might. Christ is thy strength and Christ thy right. Lay hold on life and it shall be thy joy and crown eternally. So let's stand to sing number 712.